it's high time that we must start our program so before starting the program i would like to thank everyone for joining this program uh, it is my dream project which we are successfully running for past one year so i would like to thank you for joining yet another session of brandos for those who took this program brandos is the breast and endocrine society of western uttar pradesh where on the last friday of every month at 7 pm all the clinicians with a special interest in breast and endocrinology we all meet together and discuss about one very important and interesting clinical problem that we encounter in our day to day practice we have breast meets on every even months and endocrine meets on every odd months march being an odd month we have an endocrine meet and in this meet we have a very interesting yet important clinical problem that is the biochemical evaluation of the various hormonal assays that we pres prescribe in our day to day practice friends as an endocrinologist and as an endocrine surgeon we all know we cannot proceed further even a inch without a right biochemical report no matter how high our clinical suspicion in any any patient of any clinical disorder or hormonal disorder but without a right report we cannot proceed right but the problem is that do we know that all the hormones that are being secreted in our body they are not only impacted by the dietary variation the diet drug exercise stress but also the temperature of being of collection the transport time the hormonal assays that are being used by laboratory to give us the result they all have a huge impact on the ultimate reading that we get in the printed report but are these reports really right or there is some issues some fallacies we don't know we cannot understand until unless and we cannot control until unless we have the right protocol of the collection friends the pathologists have a control in their setup inside the laboratory but the sample collection is the responsibility of clinicians of us until unless we know what is the right protocol of sample collection and their transport we cannot ensure the right way of the right protocol of it and thus we cannot ensure that we get the right report through today's program with the help of pathologists we'll try to understand the various protocols the right protocol of specimen collection their transport and their interpretation so that we upskill ourselves for a better patient management in this forum we have a multidisciplinary discussion we have endocrinologists we have pathologists we have endocrine surgeons so we have a good opportunity to discuss and understand each one's view friends now i will not take much of your time we will have a discussion and elaborate discussion later on also i would like to start the program and for which i would like to thank dr k k gupta sir who kindly consented to attend our program as a moderator dr k k gupta sir needs no introduction but still those who are new to this program and for those who belong to some far places dr k k gupta sir is the dm endocrinology of the time when this concept was very very infantile in our country he did following his md he did his dm in endocrinology in 1988 from bhu varanasi he was the founder and the head of department of endocrinology and metabolism in llrm medical college he served as a principal in llrm medical college and sn medical college agra not only that he gave his administrative services as a dgme twice in 2013 and 2017 and under his able guidance he was produced more than 30 dm endocrinology who are now successfully serving the 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 country thank you very much sir for joining us and uh, uh, before i give the the baton to the sir to sir i would the sir will tell 
more detail about our guest faculties but i would like to humbly say my sincere thanks to ish bhatia sir who was a mentor when i was under training he was the hod and i learned a lot from him and i was always fascinated by his down personality but such a high knowledge and i am very thankful sir you considered us you took out your time to attend this program and i am so excited i am going to learn a lot from you that i am sure and i am so thankful to s vittal sir he is like a fatherly figure for us because of him i must say we all endocrine surgeons are there among you he found, he is the founder of the concept of endocrine surgery in india so we consider him as the father of indian endocrine surgery and he is the founder of indian association of endocrine surgeons he is one of the very elderly endocrine surgeon who was treating endocrine disorders when the biochemical test were also very primitive sort of thing so today sir i i know i am going to learn a lot from i am so privileged and and feeling myself so high that so many great personalities are there with us in this program so kk gupta sir i request you to now take over the stage thank you very much sir you are mute sir am i audible now yes sir absolutely thank you very much friends it's still my privilege to to welcome you on this uh, forum and at the outset i am thankful to dr sudhi agarwal for calling me and uh, which i wouldn't of course refuse because i have been the minister of for many years now uh, uh, as madam told that we are dependent on pathologist as far as collection etc and the whole logistical details are concerned before getting the hormone testing so it's a chain which has to be taken care at all points now we very well know that the correct diagnosis is uh, and the therapeutic decisions rely in part on the accuracy of the test results and for the accurate test results we have to adequately prepare the patient the specimen collection has to be proper and handling has to be proper these are the very very essential prerequisites for accurate results so the accuracy of test results depends on the integrity of the specimen because all these components are integrated in the uh, in that uh, component system so that we get the result now now there are four main steps just in order because i'll not be crossing over the uh, subject of dr kansal but just to introduce the topic four main steps are involved first we have to prepare the patient we have to collect the specimen we have to process the specimen for example in the processing i'll just tell that ect sample collection has to be done in a pre chilled containers in edta and it has to be stored and refrigerated in the refrigerator centrifuge at minus 20 degrees centigrade so these are the conditions in which it has to be collected and the sample has to be preserved this is mandatory now patient has to be in basal state the storing and transporting the specimen is very very important the basal state is very important because a patient has to be fasting and should not be stressed physically emotionally and should not have done exercise prior to the test because all these are the variables which can adversely affect the result of the test now similarly time of the day of the sampling is also important because we know that pulsatile secretion is something which is uh, crucial to endocrinology pulsatile secretion diurnal variations and circadian rhythm system they also can test they also can adversely affect the result we are not conscious about that for example if we we know that the cortisol is highest in the morning and less in the evening so we have to take in account now we have to also to take in account the timing of the sample and interference by many drugs if the patient is on thiazides we are going to get hyperglycemia we are going to get hyperuricemia and so on so that all these variables could adversely affect these four components of the system logistical variables which ultimately lead to a successful evaluation of the test now during the past year the field of endocrinology has undergone remarkable changes with new techniques for measuring the hormones in serum 
and using the various radio ligands that we call as radio isotopes uh, and the new imaging methods such as CT and MRI and FNAC which have come with more precise diagnosis and understanding of the pathophysiology of the diseases. Now at the same time number of available tests also have expanded and the interference by many drugs can affect the drug. So it has challenged the skill of the practitioners in making a correct diagnosis and correct decision while interpreting these tests. Now at the best, diagnostics has very well improved the clinician's assessment of probability of disease in a patient so that the therapeutic decisions can be made. And of course, it has to be the best patient interest. And at the worst, the test caused diagnostic errors, which could increase the risk that the treatment decisions will be will not be correct, will be incorrect. So it is imperative, imperative that uh, for the for the practicing clinician to understand the method of various tests, collection and all these logistical variables have to take into account. And uh, their proper use, selection, problems involved have to be taken care of. And therefore comes the role of normal results and the various pitfalls in the testing methods that we will be discussing in detail. The sensitivity, precision, specificity, figures in the analysis and through thorough analysis of the clinical data all has to be done. Now, we know that the aggregate hormone tests, they are the crux as far as diagnosis of penicillin uh, uh, disease are concerned. The development radio of so in late 1950s by, and the Nobel, by, and the Nobel uh, prize was also given to Burson in yellow in late 1950s. This coincided with a period of great advances in the accurate detection of various peptides and of course, later the steroid hormones as well. Now, the basis of radiognosis, you know, it's the last um, law of mass action. There is a competitive innovation of binding of a leveled hormone to the antibody by unleveled hormone, which is contained in the standards or in unknown samples. Now, despite advances in laboratory techniques in the past few decades, we have seen that the pitfalls in endocrine testing can commonly happen in spite of all the advancements, and this could start the clinical picture. So, that ha has to be taken because, because in the window of error, has, has always to be taken in consideration while interpreting a hormone assay. Now we know that even though assays remain the most commonly method used to evaluate hormone disorders because uh, majority of the pathologists they do themselves the immuno assays. It's a lengthy procedure, it's a very sensitive technique, but it is time consuming and liable for some errors as well at times. So of course, the radio amino assay happens to be the gold standard for the endocrinologist and our IRMA and radio receptor assays are in oblivion now, but uh, uh, this uh, immuno assays could be divided in two groups, the competitive and the non-competitive immuno assays. Now in clinical laboratory, laboratories, we have seen that the two-step immuno assays have been replaced by the non-oisotopic single test competitive assays and the cumulative levels are the dominant methods of these assays. Now we know that the, there are many non-monal factors as well, which could adversely affect the uh, uh, assay results. Of course, change in pH, change in ionic strength of the reagents and the chemical nature of buffering solutions and the presence of uh, and absence of variety of the anticoagulants also could affect the, the uh, what you call ba uh, bad uh, impact on the antigen, antigen antibody reactions in the system. We know there is a word that is called heterogeneity of the hormones in the uh, system, our body. Most important, you know, parathyroid hormone. The C terminal is most commonly used because less sensitive anti sera could be used. Amino terminal and mid terminal are very well used. But you know that in uremia patients, there is too much of the parathyroid hormone levels because of this error also. We have taken an account. We have to take an account. Now, similarly, if you see the gastrin, there are some 17 and 34 uh, amino acid fragments in the body. And ectopic ACTH, you could see the big ACTH and all those, so that while interpreting, we have to be careful. Now, the other mode could be saliva also, which is not very well, uh, uh, very much in fashion now, but it's a very specific and very useful method for steroid hormones, especially the the uh, androgens, estrogens, and especially the cortisol also. It's quite sensitive. So we are and urine. 
we can do that also. Yes, sir. So we are going to discuss everything in detail. I'll I'll just surprise. Yes, sir. No. Sir. Yeah. Okay. Now uh, I have just introduced the topic. The yes, idea was just to introduce to you that logistical variables are there in the in the collection, in the storage, in the transport, in the testing. and then in the hormones itself as well as positively is concerned as far as the different molecular base uh, forms are concerned and those variables are there so we have very eminent people uh, prof vital and dr tansar and dr ishbeel fatia my friend i think they will enlighten and uh, uh, and clear all those doubts in the medical fraternity especially the pathologist that we have thank you very much thank you thank you very much sir for your uh, uh, kind introduction uh, Because all these points that you put it are very valid, and this is something that's why we are here to understand. So the pathologist will help us understand, and then we will have a time for elaborate discussion about it. Then we can share our experiences, our problems, everything in detail. So uh, I recall, as already I have told I, once again, uh, since that thanks to Ish Patel sir, he is. A former HOD and a, a former head of department, uh, Department of Endocrinology and Metabolism, Sanjay Gandhi Postgraduate Institute of Medical Sciences, and my teacher, and uh, Dr. S. Vital Sir. He is a Padam Shri awardee and uh, the father of Indian endocrine surgery. One of the one of the very important, the founder of endocrine surgery concept in India. Uh, our, our, Speaker is Dr. Nimni Kansal. She is MD Biochemistry, uh, te uh, Technical Director, uh, Clinical Chemistry, Biochemical Genetics, and working with Lal Pathology since 2008. And she is she will be our speaker for today. Yeah. Before we formally start our meeting, a couple of announcements to all our participants. I request everyone to please mute their mics so that we have a self-free uh, presentation. Uh, disturbance free presentation secondly in case you have any question in your mind uh, during the presentation please write it down with your name in the chat box we will note down everything and at the end of the presentation those questions will be asked from the faculties and the speaker in case you are accidentally out from the meeting please don't worry please click on the link again and you will be joined in a meeting Uh, uh as uh, as usual and uh, in, at the end of the presentation you will be given the opportunity to to ask your questions directly from the faculties once all the questions which were put in the chat box will be cleared so uh, over to you dr nimi kansal ma'am uh, i request you to please share your screen and we may start our presentation thank you thank you dr sudhi Good evening, uh, everyone. Good evening, uh, Dr. Vital Sir, Dr. Gupta, Dr. Ish Bhatia. I would like to thank uh, each one of you, Dr. Sudhi especially, for inviting me and uh, accepting me as a speaker. Thank you, everyone. With this, I'll, I'll just share my presentation. <coughs> um now uh, is my screen visible uh dr sudhi is my screen visible uh it's visible it's visible right <clears throat> so uh as requested i'll be starting with very very basic thing what is amino acid a uh, little bit about what are the different kinds of amino acid and what are the uh, advantages disadvantages of different amino acid then going to the primarily the endocrine uh, system which we uh, are planning to cover is about uh, parathyroid gland parathyroid hormones then uh, adrenal uh, followed by uh, a few chromocytoma so we'll try to cover uh, what are the uh precautions we need to take uh, for sample collection what is uh, what are the patient preparation and how the uh, temperature should be maintained for these assays so that will be the primary discussion will be around 
so uh, amino acid basically amino acid the, the, there are different ways of detecting the uh, analytes in our body so in amino acid basically it's a antigen antibody complex so if we want to detect tsh in the sample so tsh is antigen and um, antibody to tsh binds to the uh, antigen it forms a complex then there is a uh, there are different mechanism to identify these uh, reactions uh, uh which can uh, then be measured by different uh, techniques which i'll uh, come to uh, that in next um, uh, next uh, slide so basically uh, in all amino acids there is a antigen antibody complex in our body if we want to measure antibody for example um, anti tpo antibody then our uh, uh, serum sample has antibody and the reagent will have antigen to uh, uh NTTPO uh, to generate a complex. So uh, that um, as uh, uh, Dr. Gupta also mentioned that there are two type of principle uh, on which amino acids are based: non-competitive and competitive amino acid. Basically, competitive amino acids are used where the uh, molecule size mo uh, uh, molecular size is very very small. In competitive uh, in sandwich assay, we use two antibodies, and the antigen is sandwiched between two antibodies. Whereas in competitive amino assay, if the si molecular size is very small, making a sandwich is uh, difficult. So when the concentration for uh, especially like free T4, uh, free T3, where the concentration is very small, molecule is very small, their competitive amino assays are used. Uh, there are different techniques. So as I said, once antigen antibody complex is formed, there uh, we need a mechanism to detect this antigen antibody complex. So uh, 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 we know that there are different kind of amino acids. There are radio amino acids. There are ELISAs, which are enzyme linked amino acids. They produce color. Radio amino acids, they have radioactive tracer, which emits radiations. Then there are fluoro amino acid and latest being chamiluminescent uh, amino acid. So all these are amino acids. But the only difference is the detector, the way we detect the um, uh, concentration or the way we produced a signal which is measured is different. So uh, antigen antibody complex is uh, formed and then uh, there is a detector molecule. So in case of a radio amino assay, it's a radioactive tracer which binds to this antigen antibody complex and emits radiation. What we count is the uh, number of uh, 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 what we count is the radio uh, radiation produced by these tracers. In case of ELISA, there is an enzyme which uh, uh, acts on a substrate. It converts, uh, produces a color. So what we measure is the color. So higher the color, higher is the concentration of the uh, analyte. <coughs> In case of uh, F, uh, fluorescence amino acid, a fluorescent label is used. And in case of uh, chemiluminescence, either acridinium ester or luminol are used, which when oxidized, they produce light. So what we measure is uh, a light. So, uh, so these uh, amino acids, basically they use different tracers. So the basic principle of ELISA uh, or, or, or any amino assay, we have a solid phase. This is a, on which the, as a, like if we have to detect an antigen, say T4 or uh, TSH, then uh, antibody to that antigen, which we want to detect. So in this case, if this is an example of T4, so antibody to T4, they are coated on a solid surface. In this uh, solid surface, in this well, we add patient serum sample, which has antigen, which is T4. So antigen binds to the uh, antibody and forms a antigen antibody complex. To this is then added a antibody uh, which uh, uh, another antibody because uh, as i told in a sandwich elisa the antigen is sandwiched between two different types so the uh, these antibodies they did, uh, 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 they identify different epitope so if we say this the tip of the triangle is one epitope and base of the triangle is another epitope so the uh, sol uh, these uh, um, these are the two different epitope to which these antibodies bind so uh, now this antigen antibody complex is formed in which we add a conjugated antibody this antibody is has a signal now this conjugate signal in case of uh, elisa it's an enzyme 
so uh, which is added after incubation we add a substrate this enzyme then uh, acts on this sub, uh, substrate and produces a color so once this color is produced uh, this color is then measured by a photometer uh, 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 which based on the intensity of the color higher the intensity of the color higher is the concentration of that antigen so that's the basic principle of elisa this is just depicting how the sandwich complex is formed this is the um, uh, uh, one antibody this is our antigen this is another uh, antibody and then this is a detector molecule so in case of chemiluminescence this uh, instead of enzyme there is a acridinium ester where change in ph will produce light <coughs> Similarly, like this is an example of chemiluminescence. In chemiluminescence, the, the, there are paramagnetic particle. On the paramagnetic particle, uh, the antigen or antibody. Suppose we are detecting an antibody, say anti-TPO. Then antigen is coated on these paramagnetic particle. The patient serum sample has the antibody. This antigen antibody complex is formed, which then with the help of a tracer, which can be isoluminol or acridinium ester that binds and the trigger is generally change in ph so there is a acid base uh, which are used so change in ph will produce uh, light and then this light is measured in terms of rlu and these rlu is then converted into the concentration just to, uh, uh, because uh, in uh, hormonal assays we read a lot about high dose hook effect so what is high dose hook effect for a antigen antibody complex to form and to become measurable the concentration uh, of antigen antibody they have to be in a, uh, a balance so if there is an excess of antibody then also the, um, uh, uh, the this antigen antibody complex they are not formed in a detectable manner and similarly if there is antigen excess then also there is uh, antibodies are less and antigen antibody uh, so there is no zone of equivalence in such conditions we tend to have false negative or false negative uh, uh, false positive results so reagents are made in such a way that by and large most of the time antigen antibody are complex uh, the uh, uh, antibodies are in excess so the antigen antibody complex is formed but uh, if the concentration of antigen, say like in case of prolactin, concentration is very, very high, then this complex may not form and we may get falsely low results. And that's the reason it's uh, uh, generally like many a times we get a request that we are suspecting prolactinoma. You do this sample in dilution and we, the sample is done in dilution so that we can achieve this equivalence zone. So, uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Gupta also mentioned that now RIA, uh, radio amino assay, there was a time when radio amino assay was considered gold standard for all the hormonal assays and had a predominant, um, uh, uh, predominantly RIAs were being used. But now uh, there are very, very sensitive assays uh, uh, following RIA, they were ELISA and now it's clear. So, uh, why RIA? is now not being preferred because RIA radio amino acids, they uh, generate radioactive waste and there are various uh, stringent compliance uh, which a lab has to follow, which are the guidelines are uh, released by AERB. The, uh, the lab has to have a individual who is trained by AERB to handle radioactive waste. So the uh, then they, they have a stringent guideline for the uh, lab area uh, in which radio amino assay can be run. So there is a separate dedicated space required for RIA and uh, these other uh, uh, tracer generally iodine tracer iodine 123 is the tracer which is used in RIA assay. It has a very short half life of 60 days. That means you cannot have uh, if the uh, um, uh, you procure more reagent, then there uh, you, uh, the lab faces a challenge of expiry of the reagent. So because of and the sensitivity of RIA is very less as compared to clear, clear. So because of these limitations now and uh, and this cannot be automated also. Like RIA is generally by a manual uh, test where you need manpower to do these tests, and uh, so that is why the high volume samples, high volume uh, labs, they cannot. Uh, maintain uh, they cannot give out report in time and uh, uh, by RIA so uh, because of these limitations now RIA is phasing out uh, by and large now all the labs they have moved to clear 
because chemiluminescence uh, as they have a very high sensitivity and specificity the dynamic range is also very very wide like i was giving an example of prolactin uh, we do uh, the prolactin in case of prolactin the high dose hook effect is seen if the concentration is more than 30000 uh, nanogram per ml and i, I i'm frankly uh, telling you in last my 15 years of practice we we handle very high volume of prolactin almost we do uh, more than 6 7000 of prolactin in a month but um, uh, in last 15 years i have never seen prolactin concentration which is more than 3000 or 4000 nanogram per ml so high dose hook effect practically because of very wide dynamic range we don't get to see and high degree of and um, i think uh, till date i have witnessed only one case of uh, high dose hook effect that was progesterone because the uh, linearity is only up to about 60 nanogram per ml and that patient had a value very high and when we received a uh, um, concern from the clinician we investigated and uh, when the sample was run in dilution we found that the progesterone levels were high and uh, 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 as i mentioned that uh, automation is the need of the day not only for the precision but also to have a better turnaround time to give a faster report and to handle high volumes so automation is the need of our so clear can be easily automated so because of all these reasons now um, uh, almost uh, all the labs they have moved from ria to clear so uh, these are the uh, just to mention about the different uh, vacutainers because when we are discussing about sample collection tube it's important that we know that what kind of uh, different tubes are available and as far as hormones are concerned uh, the two main type of tubes because the two main type of sample which are used are either plasma or serum so uh, to collect for the sample collection of the serum there are two kind of tubes which are available that is uh, Uh, a red top tube and yellow top tube so this is a red top tube and this is a yellow top tube uh, the sizes of these tube can vary this is a 75 mm tube and there are also 100 mm tubes which are available generally these tubes they have written on their uh, tube that what is the volume required so normally for these sst's you require around uh, red top or uh, yellow top 75 mm you require 4 ml of uh, blood to be collected whereas if it is a 100 mm tube you need 6 ml of blood to be collected so um, uh, uh, the red top uh, they don't have they they just have a clot activator so when you whenever you collect the sample uh, the after collecting the sample there should be a gentle 8 to 10 times the tube should should be gently inverted so that it gets mixed up and uh, the uh, it, uh, the clot activator helps in um, uh, catalyzing the clotting time and uh, the clot activator with gel these tubes they have a uh, gel so when the sample is centrifuged there is a gel which settles between the um uh, cells and the serum so it acts as a separator between serum and uh, 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 rbcs so the advantage of these uh, uh, clot activator gel is that you don't need to transfer serum in a separate tube because in red top tube there is no separator so after centrifugation if you have to transport the tube to a different location you have to separate serum in a different tube so that the integrity of the sample is maintained whereas in case of uh, yellow top because there is a gel uh, barrier in between the serum and the cells the same tube can be transported to a different location by maintaining temperature so uh, that's the advantage of using a gel tube the only uh, place where we do not advocate using yellow top is when if we have to measure drugs like phenobarbitone um thiazide uh, phenobarbitone uh, like um, anti epileptic drugs valproic acid and all because then in those cases gel interfere with estimation of these drugs so those are the cases where we don't recommend gel tube otherwise by and large by all wherever we need serum these tubes can be used uh, for operational ease then coming to whole blood collection so generally it's the edta blood which is used for whole blood collection Uh, in the edta tube they are uh, purple top these are universal coding so for edta it's a lavender top for serum either it's red or yellow 
so these are your i will not go into details of others because they are not primarily used for hormonal collections and all so uh, these edta tubes uh, they contain uh, potassium edta and the potassium uh, uh, so again the whole blood because we are collecting whole blood so in these cases these tube they have to be centrifuged and the plasma has to be separated for transportation because transportation of whole blood uh, may compromise sample integrity so the sample is wherever plasma like in case of acth we need plasma in case of um, uh, it's primarily acth where we need plasma though pth also uh, the studies say edta is a better sample but uh, serum is also acceptable but in case of renin plasma is required in case of aldosterone plasma is required so those are the cases where you collect sample in edta after collecting sample in edta you have to centrifuge you have to separate plasma and transport it at the temperature the, uh, that's of course is the responsibility of the lab to maintain the cold chain once the sample is collected so these are the different types of tubes which are used for sample collection uh, so coming to the um, uh, uh, basic uh, variables which can affect uh, uh, hormones levels or uh, the different analytes level it's the patient status and physiology i'm uh, please excuse for this spelling i think i just copied this image so age and gender like uh, the best example is we know about um, you know, gonadotropins they were the age and gender they play a significant role the uh, level of um, androgens the estrogen uh, etc they vary with age and gender the patient preparation uh, most of the hormone survey uh, know that the in case of pth in case of acth the fasting is preferred because uh, uh, um, though there are no uh, there, there is no documented that what is the effect of fast, uh, after taking if sample is taken after food but generally it is said that if you are taking fasting you minimize most of the interferences so generally for most of the cases fasting is preferred blood collection time because of circadian rhythm and diurnal variation there are particular collection time based on the hormone which i'll discuss in detail when i come to those body posture is very very important in case of aldosterone renin metanephrine where like whether you are taking sample in a supine position or you are taking sample in a uh, upright posture the reference ranges will vary because the uh, the concentration of the hormone varies so the reference ranges are also different so it's important for the clinician to know whether the uh, sample was taken in a supine position or in a upright position normally like we have standardized guideline in which the sample should be taken and the reference ranges for both supine and upright position is given then the laboratory process uh, what is the time taken a uh, venous stasis is important in case of calcium because uh, normally to collect sample we tie a tourniquet if tourniquet is left for a very long time it may lead to a change in ph and then it affects calcium concentration generally increase in ph will lead to increase in uh, <coughs> calcium level and the storage time and temperature as uh, dr gupta also highlighted um, he mentioned about acth collection that acth has to be collected in a pre chill tube as soon as the sample is collected the centrifugation should takes place in a cold centrifuge the plasma is separated then the plasma should be frozen and transported in that condition so these are very important guidelines for transportation for maintaining temperature so the lab doing all these tests has a very a high responsibility it's the responsibility that they collect they follow the protocol of uh, collection they should have a educated phlebotomist they should have edu they should have a very good and efficient system of logistic for transportation they should have a system where uh, the temperature in our lab we use uh, five layers like we have a gel form on which we place a um, uh ice pack and then the sample then again over that there is a ice pack between the two layer of ice pack samples are packed and then there is a data logger which uh, which is controlled by our quality department to monitor the uh, temperature of the transportation boxes so transportation temperature is very critical for maintaining integrity of the sample so uh, uh, from uh, sample collection that was a generalized uh, uh, slide now moving on to more specific hormones we start with what are the different tests for parathyroid functions 
and what are the precautions to be taken for collection of these sample so uh, briefly although i know that i am sitting with the um, endocrinologist and aap logon ko sabko uh, uh, like most of you uh, know about pth and vitamin d but this is just to summarize that uh, we know, we all know that pth is important regulator for calcium and uh, phosphate hem hemostasis so the main role of pth to maintain calcium levels in our body and the target organs are bone kidney intestine and uh, uh, parathyroid so uh, primarily vitamin d uh, which is uh, in a pre vitamin d3 form in the skin under the action of uv light it gets converted into cholesterol gets converted into pre vitamin d3 which goes to liver in the liver by action of 25 hydroxylase it gets converted into 25 hydroxy vitamin d which in the kidney 25 hydroxy vitamin d in the kidney is converted into 125 dihydroxy vitamin d by action of 1 alpha hydroxylase enzyme the pth hypocalcemia is uh, a very strong stimulus for pth uh, hypocalcemia or hypomagnesium they stimulate pth the pth secretion as uh, mentioned that pth the role of pth is to uh, raise serum calcium level so it acts on three organs to uh, increase uh, pth uh, increase uh, calcium levels from the bone by resorption of calcium the bone uh, on the small intestine by increasing absorption of calcium it also acts on kidney to increase uh, by activating 1 alpha hydroxylase so calcitriol plays an important role in absorption of calcium from the small intestine so and it inhibits um, it also uh, decreases excretion of calcium so all these actions combined together they increases serum calcium levels so uh, hypothyroidism is not very common hyperthyroid hyperparathyroidism is very common hypoparathyroidism is primarily following uh, thyroid surgery so um, uh, i'll be uh, talking more about hyperparathyroidism so hyperparathyroidism is a condition where a pth levels are elevated and uh, uh, which uh, the increase the para hyperparathyroidism can be classified into three groups primary secondary and tertiary primary hyperparathyroidism where primarily it's due to some adenoma of parathyroid gland or para hyperplasia because uh, of um, adenoma there is increase in pth which uh, generally leads to high calcium so in case of primary hyperparathyroidism we can find high calcium pth can be normal or high and vitamin d can be low or normal whereas in case of secondary hyperparathyroidism it is generally either due to vitamin d or due to renal failure where we find high pth but calcium may be low in case of tertiary hyperparathyroidism uh, which is uh, uh, generally uh, due to long standing secondary hyperparathyroidism not very common so it's it's important that whenever we are taking sample for pth we also ask for serum calcium so pth and serum calcium they should always be measured together because it helps in the diagnosis and reaching at a it helps in interpretation of the pth result <coughs> so there are certain important variables of pth uh, so also race pth has been reported to be higher in black as compared to white people pth concentration increases with age these are important uh, factor which we should take into uh, account and um, uh, as with the increasing age there is a decline in gfr which probably lead to increase in pth levels and obese people they have higher pth concentration vitamin d there are many studies which say that uh, pth level should be determined in vitamin d replete because if vitamin uh, if pth because many, because of the very high prevalence of vitamin d deficiency the apparently healthy normal we when we measure pth the it may be a, a slightly higher so uh, uh, pth concentration should be seen in uh, background of vitamin d levels biotin supplements there are a lot of uh, all almost all the hormonal assays they use biotin as a conjugated antibody so it's uh, really recommended because there are uh, different assays different platforms they will have different interference with biotin 
some assays have uh, interference with biotin at very very high concentration therefore it is generally now recommended that it's better to avoid biotin supplementation at least 8 hours prior to giving sample for any hormonal assay uh a pre analytical for pth uh, generally uh, both uh, edta sample and serum sample are acceptable for pth but uh, generally said that pth is more stable in edta as compared to serum but both the samples are acceptable storage condition um, uh, uh, it is stable at uh, room temperature 7 to 8 hours pth is stable uh, provided centrifugation takes place within half an hour and the serum or plasma is separated from the cells then pth is stable for 8 hours at room temperature but uh, after that it has to be stored at 4 degree centigrade if uh, the testing is to be delayed for a longer time the sampling site um, uh, generally it's peripheral blood but uh, if it uh, the concentration is higher in central blood um, and uh, uh, those the sampling time there is a circadian rhythm but uh, generally it is preferred that the sample is given in the fasting in the morning so these are the different platform which are used for measuring intact pth about rosh siemens beckman almost all they use second generation of amino acids and everybody uh, recommends that pth is stable uh, of the clot uh, there are different guidelines like as i mentioned pth is stable for 8 hour at room temperature 2 days at 4 degree centigrade but if it has to be stored longer then it has to be uh, stored frozen uh, then after uh, for more than uh, 48 hours the plasma should not be like in a, for a long term storage it is at minus 20 it is stable even for 6 months so different uh, um, uh, 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 manufacturer they have different uh, storage time but by and large uh, if stored frozen at minus 70 for one month it is stable <coughs> so uh, as mentioned that specimen requirement for pth it can be serum or edta plasma uh important point both the samples are acceptable but edt is more uh, stable why normally lab prefers serum because uh, as i mentioned that pth and calcium they should be measured uh, uh, from the ideally whenever you are requesting for pth calcium should always be done so calcium cannot be measured in edta plasma because edta tends to chelate calcium and uh, the results you will get in plasma for calcium is in negative so uh, it's not recommend edta plasma is not recommended for calcium so therefore generally lab uh, they ask for a serum sample for pth because then you can measure calcium also in the same sample otherwise for calcium you will have to sell, collect a separate sample in a separate tube which is serum tube so calcium cannot be measured in plasma <coughs> as i mentioned for pth room temperature 8 hours it is stable 2 to 8 degree centigrade 72 hours it is stable and in a frozen condition 8 months uh, uh, this is for plasma and for serum a uh, room temperature 4 hours it is stable and uh, for at 2 to 8 degree centigrade separated serum is stable for 48 hours and frozen it is also stable for 8 months um uh, fasting um, overnight fasting is preferred and generally it is preferred that the sample is given in the morning hours between 8 to 10 am uh, uh this is uh, as i mentioned that nowadays biotin supplements sometimes because unknowingly some beauty product and all they might be having very high concentration of biotin therefore it's recommended that at least 8 to 12 hours before the sample collection any biotin supplement should be avoided and since pth is secreted in pulsatile fa fashion therefore it is also recommended at least um, uh, like you should uh, make interpretation of pth result at least two uh, two times it should be tested it should be tested on more than one occasion to avoid any misinterpretation so this i am just giving you an example sometimes we get uh, different results one lab has given you a lab pth result of 80 picogram per ml the reference range is 80 10 to 65 Sec uh, after 3 uh, 4 days patient repeat sample uh, retest 
and the result comes out to be 60. Now we are varying because 80 is falling out of range, whereas 60 is falling within the reference range. So are these two values different or they are comparable? Sometimes we do get these kind of query that there is a difference in the result. Probably one of the result is wrong. So what I wanted to say that uh, whenever we are seeing uh, such kind of result, there are different variations which we have to consider that what is the biological variation. So PTH, the biological variation is around 20%. So in a healthy person, PTH can vary by 20%, whereas if a patient is on hemodialysis, there can be a variation up to 30%. So that's within individual variation. Then on, uh, then we have to add to this variation, if there are two different samples, then we have to add analytical variation to that also. So statistically, this is an equation which is generally used where we take into consideration uh, analytical variation and uh, within individual variation, biological variation to say what is the percentage difference which is acceptable between two different samples collected on two different days. So uh, if we uh, use this equation, it comes out that 60 to 60 percent of the variation is uh, you may observe in the same individual. So it, uh, if we uh, see the difference between this, these two values, 80 and 60, the percentage difference is only 28 percent. So basically, these two values are not very different. It's an inherent biological variation and the analytical variation because of which these two values are um, uh, uh, these uh, you are observing these two values, but statistically uh, these two values are not. So we cannot say that the levels have decreased or the levels have increased. Looking at these two values, this is so. This difference is <coughs> attributable to biological variation. There are certain questions which comes for hyperparathyroidism. Uh, is it possible that you can have? Um, uh, normal hyper para, uh, normal pth level in a patient who has hyperparathyroidism so it's uh, uh, as i mentioned that yes because hypercalcemia in a patient with a hypercalcemia if pth level is not suppressed then most likely it is hyperparathyroidism because uh, whenever there is a hypercalcemia and if the parathyroid gland is working normally the hypercalcemia will lead to suppression of pth so in a patient who has hypercalcemia, if PTH is uh, in the normal range or it's not suppressed, then it's an indication for hyperparathyroidism. Uh -huh. And 25 to 30% of the patient, it's the similar, can PTH be normal in a patient with hyperparathyroidism? Yes, because uh, 25 to 30% of the patients with primary hyperthyroidism, they can have normal PTH level. So with a high calcium, if PTH is not suppressed, most likely it is primary hyperparathyroidism. <coughs> Um, and this, this was a case where a 63-year-old man incidentally found to have high serum calcium level of 10.4 on a routine lab. Subsequently, uh, PTH level was measured, which was high. It was 92 picogram. Uh, the patient which was consistent with high calcium. And this patient had a low vitamin D level, which was 21 picogram. Level. So the patient had a high PTH level, high calcium, but vitamin D level was 21. He was misdiagnosed as a case of vitamin D deficiency. So to this patient, high doses of vitamin D was given, thinking that probably a high, a low vitamin D led to a high PTH and high PTH led to high calcium. So uh, leading to diagnosis of vitamin D deficiency. But this uh, a year later, the patient came back with osteopenia and affected renal function. So we have to remember that high pth does stimulate conversion of 25 what happens uh, in case of hyperparathyroidism high pth because uh, as i mentioned in my previous slide also vitamin d is uh, converted to active form 125 dihydroxy vitamin d in the presence of pth so if the pth levels are high pth high pth level stimulates conversion of 25 hydroxy to more active form of vitamin D leading to high calcium. So what we major normally is 25. Whenever you order a vitamin D assay, normally the form which is majored is 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is to uh, see the, uh, uh, to monitor vitamin D levels. 
So since uh, this PTH uh, uh, in presence of high PTH, the conversion of 25 hydroxy to 125 hydroxy is activated. So that may be the reason the concentration of 25 hydroxy vitamin D is low. But high calcium, high PTH is always primary hyperparathyroidism. So this is a very busy chart. I'm not reading this entire chart because when discussion with Dr. Shruti, there was generally a discussion that what all parameters should be measured for the evaluation of primary, secondary and tertiary hyperparathyroidism. So PTH, calcium, phosphorus, 25 hydroxy vitamin D and 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. These are the by and large PTH, calcium and 25 hydroxy vitamin D will be able to answer most of your questions. But you may have to measure PTH related protein when uh, you are suspecting hypercalcemia of magnesium. But these are the parameters and the different levels under different conditions which are mentioned to diagnose uh, cases of hyperparathyroidism. <coughs> this is the algorithm given in uh, some of the textbook for evaluation of hypercalcemia that serum calcium should always be measured with PTH. Um, uh, so, a major PTH, if the values are normal or elevated, you should uh, ask history of lithium ingestion. If no, then high PTH, uh, normal or uh, high PTH with high calcium is primary hyperparathyroidism. If primary hyperparathyroidism is ruled out and you still have hypercalcemia and PTH is low, then probably the next cause is thiazide diuretic. If that is also ruled out, then malignancy. To know whether uh, if uh, there is obvious malignancy, then probably hypercalcemia is due to the malignancy. If there is no obvious malignancy, then PTH-related protein can help you in diagnosis. If PTH-related protein is elevated, that may be suggestive of malignancy. And if that is also ruled out, probably 25-hydroxy vitamin D high levels of 25 hydroxy, probably it's a case of vitamin D toxicity. So that's how uh, the, the algorithm for hypercalcemia, but being a clinician, you are a better judge, the algorithm to be followed for uh, diagnosis. Another important point is that uh, you have collected the sample, you have sent it to the lab. What you need to know is what is the generation of that because PTH essay there are three generations which are available PTH first second and third generation first generation is now obsolete primarily most of the labs they use second generation PTH essay the ha half-life of intact PTH is only two to three minutes and half-life of so this is intact PTH which has amino acid 1 to 84 this is the amino terminal and 34 to 84 this is the carboxy terminal so uh, mostly uh, the carboxy terminal, it has a higher uh, uh, T half, 5 to 10, and the concentration is also high because half-life is 5 to 10 times of the intact PTH. <coughs> so the second generation, uh, um, I'll go to the next slide. So uh, the first generation, as I mentioned, first generation and second generation. So first generation uh amino acids um they generally use a carboxy terminal uh the antibody is direct directed against mid terminal or carboxy terminal therefore the concentration because carboxy terminal concentration is very high because of very uh long half-life the concentration generally documented by first generation are very high therefore they are they, their use has now been discontinued uh, the second generation amino acid, they use two antibodies. The first antibody is directed against N terminal, which is 12 to 24 or 26 to 34, or and the second antibody is directed towards carboxy terminal. So it was thought that this detects only 1 to 84, that is intact PTH, but now uh, it has been found that this assay has a high cross reactivity with PTH fragment 7 to 84. So the intact PTH, they also detect this fragment PTH 7 to 84 and that is why the concentration of second P generation PTH is actually slightly higher and it's not true uh, intact PTH. In the third generation PTH assays, and terminal antibody is uh, directed against 1 to 4 and C terminal against 39 to 84. Therefore, it is thought that this is more specific for uh, intact PTH, but the third generation immunoassays are not very widely available. 
there is a difference in the uh, reference range of intact pth and third generation intact pth is generally 10 to 65 or uh, up to some essays they have 70 whereas as because third generation pth is more specific for intact pth the reference range for third generation pth is lower as compared to second generation therefore when you get a report from the lab it's important for you to know whether it's a second generation or third generation pth <coughs> in our lab we are using second generation pth um uh, for calcium also as i mentioned that uh, that was all about pth for calcium also we need to uh, uh, look at the uh, sample requirement as i mentioned serum is a <laughs> recommended specimen for calcium edta is not recommended because edt or oxalate they tend to chelate calcium and uh, uh, that is why true concentration is not uh, um, uh, uh, given by edta so for total calcium and ionized calcium both you need serum they are stable at room temperature for as long as eight hours uh, after centrifugation the serum is stable for three weeks at two to eight and frozen calcium is stable for six months. The important precaution which need to be taken for sample collection of calcium is to, uh, especially for ionized calcium, is not to apply tunicate. Mm. And if you have to apply, it should be applied just before sampling and should be removed as soon as possible because when you apply to tunicate, stasis of blood can lead to increase in pH. Also, uh, the feast clenching and forearm exercise should be avoided because that leads to lactic acid production, which can decrease pH. And if the pH decreases, the uh, there can be increase in free calcium uh, levels. That's why in case of ionized calcium, the uh, you should uh, completely fill the tube. Complete tube filled completely means so that uh, there is no uh, it should be tightly sealed so that there is no loss of carbon dioxide. There is no change in pH. That is why it's recommended for ionized calcium. You have to take due precaution. Uh, uh, do not apply to Nikkei. Avoid feast clinching and forearm exercise. Tube should be filled completely. But as I mentioned on all these tubes, the, um, uh, the volume of sample to be collected is mentioned. Then they should be tightly sealed to avoid loss of carbon dioxide because loss of carbon dioxide again will lead to decrease in pH. <coughs> that was about uh, pH and calcium. Just give me a break. I, I, I need some water. Just give me a second. I'll take some water. It was very nicely presented by Dr. Mimi Kansal. And I request the uh, any participants, they might be having questions regarding the presentations done till now. They can write the queries in the chat box. So we will be noting down that after the presentation, we will discuss about, about those questions. Yeah. So, Dr. Sudhi, we move to next topic or? Uh... Yeah, sure, ma'am. We, we can move ahead. Anyone? Mm -hmm. Want to ask any question? They can write in the chat box. We will take the question. Okay. Okay. Right. Then going to uh, moving on to the next uh, topic that is Cushing syndrome. <coughs> Cushing syndrome, as you all know, that Cushing syndrome is because of autonomous excessive production of cortisol, and uh, the cortisol production could be due to uh, it could be ACTH dependent or could be ACTH independent. Uh, ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome is Cushing's disease or uh, ectopic ACTH secreting tumor, whereas ACTH independent are adenoma, carcinoma, nodular adrenal hyperplasia, or adenocortical rest tumor. These are the typical uh, presenting features of Cushing syndrome that is uh, moon faces, buffalo hum, increased facial hair thinning of scalp here so you will know that these are the typical uh, stry easy bruising these are the features of clinical features of um, Cushing syndrome 
the important test uh, the, i have taken this from endocrine society of clinical practice guideline published in 2008 so the four important tests which are recommended as initial screening test for uh, 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 for diagnosis of cushing syndrome are urine free cortisol 24 hour urinary free cortisol which should be measured at least two times to on two different occasion to reach at a diagnosis late night salivary cortisol midnight salivary cortisol a uh, major twice on two different occasions or 1 mg overnight dexamethasone suppression test uh, the first three are more commonly uh, used the low dose dst uh, can be used in certain uh, condition but primarily the first three test either urinary free cortisol or midnight salivary cortisol or 1 mg overnight dexamethasone suppression test these are the main uh, initial these are the test which should be used initially for diagnosis of cushing syndrome in a suspected case of cushing syndrome it is recommended not to use serum cortisol random serum cortisol or plasma acth level as initial screening test for uh, these uh, suspected cases the procedure to collect 24 hour urinary cortisol the 24 hour urinary cortisol you require a preservative so generally the labs they give a, give a container which has uh, in which you can collect 24 hour units and the containers generally have pres a preservative in case of cortisol 50% acetic acid or boric acid is preferred it can be uh, it should not be stored at a ambient temperature room temperature it should always be stored in a refrigerated condition frozen generally not required if you are keeping re it refrigerated that maintains integrity of the sample the hydrochloric acid or nitric acid thymol toluene these are the uh, these should not be used for collection so boric acid is preferred and 50 percent acetic acid is also acceptable preservative <clears throat> so for collection of 24 hour uh, urine sample for any times whenever it's not only for cortisol whenever we have to collect 24 hour urine sample it's very important we give clear instruction to the patient how to collect urine sample so the first instruction to be given that the collection should start in the morning so the patient when gets up in the morning so in the morning the patient will void the first morning urine the patient has to discard that's a overnight uh, collection. So the first morning uh, urine should be discarded. And then say at 8 a.m. the patient starts the collection. After that, every void should be collected. Now the patient should not void directly into the 24-hour urine container because these 24-hour urine container, they generally have some preservative, sometimes uh, HCL is also used as a preservative, so especially in case of VMA, in case of metanephrine, HCL is used as a preservative. So if they uh, urinate directly into the 24-hour urine container, the HCL may splash and may cause burn. So the patient should be advised to void urine in a separate small container and that container then should be poured into the 24-hour urinary container. So 24-hour urinary container should be kept refrigerated every void like the first morning void urine is uh, discarded the after that every time the patient uh, voids the urine that has to be collected till next morning so the last void in the next morning should be collected and should be uh, 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 given to the lab so once the, um, the bladder has been emptied into collection on the second mo morning, the sample collection procedure is complete. We should advise patient not to drink excessive uh, uh, water, not to take excessive uh, excess of fluid that may dilute the results. And in case of cortisol uh, urine, the patient should avoid using any glucocorticoid preparation, any steroid containing skin or hemorrhoid cream. Uh, um, the uh, uh, false positive results has been reported in case of use of diuretic or very high salt intake or if patient has depression or stress. Generally, a urine cortisol concentration of less than 50 microgram per day, it excludes the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome. 
uh, urine cortisol is considered important because uh, what we measure in case of urinary cortisol is free cortisol because uh, cortisol we know that it circulates in the uh, circulates bound to protein uh, large uh, uh, so uh, whereas free cortisol is the active uh, uh, hormone so uh, when we measure urinary cortisol what we are measuring is free cortisol which is not affected by the concentration of binding protein because uh, if the concentration of binding protein alters, then the concentration of circulating cortisol also alters. So that is why free cortisol levels are preferred over bound uh, or over the total cortisol level which we measure in the serum. So urine, <coughs> urine hormone therefore are useful when the hormone has a short biological half life. Uh, the secretion is pulsatile because in the serum there will be effect of here we are collecting 24 hour urine sample so the effect of even if there is a pulsatile secretion of the hormone that effect is negated and uh, also the concentration of urinary cortisol is not affected by the concentration of uh, uh, cortisol binding globulin or albumin because their concentration may change in certain conditions. The only limitation is the uh, patient has to uh, be at home for 24 hours urinary collection which patient may not find very comfortable and uh, the completeness of collection cannot be ensured but if the patient uh, so that's a limitation and in a patient with impaired renal function the urinary cortisol may not be a very good uh, sample. So uh, these are the uh, limitations, otherwise urinary free cortisol measurement is considered a superior screening test for cortisol excess and it should be measured at least two to three times. It should, uh, if the urinary free cortisol is two to three times of the upper limit of reference interval, the generally that's diagnostic of Cushing syndrome. Another uh, uh, sample which is uh, important is midnight salivary cortisol. So in salivary cortisol, again, uh, when uh, the cortisol, what we measure is free cortisol mm -hmm. because uh, the uh, uh, cortisol bound to uh, albumin or globulin is not uh, transported inside salivary gland. So when uh, we collect salivary cortisol sample, that's basically free cortisol. And there is a... Uh, 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 <coughs> and since uh, it's a saliva, it's non-invasive procedure. It's uh, though it has to be collected at night between 11 p.m. to 12 p.m. But still, it's a convenient screening test for Cushing syndrome. So, um, uh, <coughs> free fraction, though it comprises only 2.2 to 5 percent of the total hormone concentration, it is totally in equilibrium with the cortisol the plasma cortisol and the uh, salivary cortisol they are in equilibrium therefore uh, if the concentration in the uh, plasma is high the concentration in saliva is also high the concept by midnight cortisol is uh, considered important because um, uh, uh, the, uh, in general cortisol uh, we know that uh, it has a it uh, rises in the morning between three to four. morning cortisol is higher as compared to evening cortisol so the cortisol concentration it rises in the morning and it reaches at peak between 7 a.m to 9 a.m after that it falls and at midnight or during that the person is not fit the level of cortisol is low this circadian rhythm is lost in cases of uh, Cushing syndrome. Therefore, uh, in, uh, there is an absence of late night cortisol nadir, which is consistent with biochemical abnormality seen in Cushing syndrome patient. So basically, uh, in a patient who has Cushing syndrome, the midnight fall, which is generally seen in a normal individual, is not seen. So therefore, midnight cortisol levels are high in uh, suspected case of uh, Cushing syndrome. So if the concentration, the sample should be collected uh, between 11 to 12 uh, uh, in the night. And if the concentration is less than 145 nanogram per DL, it rules out Cushing syndrome. It has been found that the uh, salivary cort uh, midnight cortisol level, they are 90 to 100% sensitive and 93 to 100% specificity for Cushing disease. The limitation of the test that um, in case of depressive illness, you may get false positive result. 
uh, in a shift worker or in a critical uh, in a critically ill patient you may get false positive results chewing to tobacco or smoking may also increase lively cortisol uh these uh, therefore chewing tobacco and smoking should be avoided before sample collection uh cortisol uh is uh, salivary cortisol may be transiently abnormal in uh, when a individual shift from one time zone to different time zone therefore stress and all these should be avoided before collection because they may give you false positive results so uh, for sample collection simply it has to be they are simple uh, screw cap container the uh, before the sample collection the patient should rinse mouth thoroughly uh, brushing should be avo avoided before uh, collection uh, immediately before collection so uh, collect sample before brushing teeth avoid any stress exercise eating drinking at least 30 minutes prior to the sample collection smoking should be avoided um ideal sampling time is between 11 pm to 12 midnight so that is the time sample should be collected and once the sample is collected it should should be simply kept refrigerated or frozen and then transported to the <coughs> to the lab uh, salivary cortisol is stable for 6 hours at room temperature refrigerated it is stable for 4 days and frozen condition it is stable for 1 year in our lab we measure by chemiluminescence and uh, once in a week so that's the procedure for collecting salivary cortisol for one milligram dexamethasone suppression test the uh, rationale for using uh, dexamethasone suppression test is that low dose of dexamethasone suppresses ACTH and cortisol production in a normal subject but in a patient with uh, Cushing syndrome this suppression does not happen so <clears throat> one milligram of dexamethasone is given to the patient at night between 10 to 12 and then the sample for cortisol is drawn in the next morning at 8 am if the uh, serum cortisol go, uh, drops below 22 microgram per dl then that is considered a uh, normal response i think in endocrine society guideline it's given 1.8 microgram per dl so if you observe that a serum cortisol uh, concentration is less than 10 mi mi 2 microgram then that's a normal uh, response but if the concentration is above 5 microgram per dl then um, uh, uh, it's uh, it is suggestive of uh, cushing's disease uh, the, the cutoff is different. They say that if we use a cutoff of 2, then the sensitivity is very high, 95%. If you use a cutoff of 5, then the sensitivity reduces, but the specificity is very high. So generally, as a screening test, I believe normally we prefer using a more sensitive test. And uh, uh, so you rule in the patient by using a sensitive test, whereas you can rule out the disease by using a more specific test. So false positive results can be observed if patient has stress, obese, infection, alcohol, OCP, pregnancy. So these are some of the conditions where you may get false positive results. So when you interpret the results, you should be aware of uh, these reasons. Uh, then there is 2 mg per day, 48 hour dexamethasone suppression test. This is given in doses of 0 0.5 mg for 48 hours. The test begins at uh, 9 a.m. on day 1. The 0 0.5 milligram of dexamethasone is given at 6 hour interval. That is at 9, 15, 21 and 3. Then the serum cortisol is measured. Uh, sample is collected next day morning at 9 and 6 hour after the last dose of 6 dexamethasone. I did not get much information about this. Then this was the uh, this is the algorithm which is given in Endocrine Society Clinical Practice Guideline for uh, screening patient with Cushing syndrome. So as mentioned earlier, any of the three screening tests, late night cortisol, overnight one DST or twenty four hour urinary free cortisol assay, can be used as initial training uh, screening test. If the result is abnormal, one should rule out any physiological causes of hypercortisolism because there are various causes of um, uh, physiological causes of hypercortisolism such as 
pregnancy, depression, alcohol, morbid obesity, poorly controlled diabetes mellitus. All these are the conditions for hypercortisolism. So if all these conditions are rolled, uh, rolled out, it's important that a patient is referred to an endocrinologist and then further studies are performed to diagnose the case. So from Cushing syndrome, uh, I'm moving to pheochromocytoma, which is the last for our um, uh, discussion today. Uh, pheochromocytoma, we all know pheochromocytoma and paraganglionoma. They are catecholamine producing tumors, which are derived from neural crest. Uh, neuroblastoma primarily presents in childhood, whereas PPGL, uh, pheochromocytoma and paraganglionoma, they are tumors of adulthood. <clears throat> um, the pheochromocytoma they arises from the adrenomedullary chromaffin cells and primarily they secrete catecholamines. Whereas paraganglionoma they are extra adrenal tumor and uh, they arises from the chromaffin cells located in thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. Paraganglionoma located uh, in the neck and base of skull they do not produce catecholamine. So uh, 80% 80 to 85 percent of the pheochromocytoma they of Adrenal, adrenal origin and 10 to 20 percent can be of extra adrenal tissue. The prevalence of uh, PPGL is uh, uh, almost 1.5 to 4 uh, per 1 lakh patient because secondary hypertension whenever we are evaluating. So the uh, many a times a hypertensive patient is left without any investigations thinking that it's essential hypertension but truly speaking 10% of the Indian population, they have one or the other cause of hypertension. Therefore, whenever uh, you should keep a high suspicion for hypertension and a secondary hypertension should be ruled out in a patient with uh, repeated uh, 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 with a uncontrolled hypertension or a uh, hypertensive crisis. Uh, so 0.2 to 0.6% of hypertensive patients, they have uh, PPGL tumor is found. And in children, the hypertension prevalence is about 1.7%. Um, as I mentioned that in India, 25.3% of the Indian adults, they have hypertension. And if we translate it into absolute term, there might be 2 million of uh, patients with uh, PPGL. Uh, most of the time in our lab also, when we uh, take history, we, we find high levels of uh, metanephrine or VMAs and we, uh, or uh, plasma metanephrine. Contact the clinician to take the history and many a time we get a history of adrenal incidentaloma. So uh, the uh, nearly 5% of the pheochromocytoma are discovered in uh, adrenal incidentalomas. The, uh, uh, you know better than me what is the clinical importance of PPGL because these are, uh, as Dr. Sudhi also mentioned in her talk, that they are treatable cases. So we have to have a high level of suspicion. And if diagnosed, these conditions can be treated because PPGLs can be removed. And, uh, the, uh, and generally, the patients with PPGL, they have high cardiovascular morbidity and mortality as compared to essential hypertension patients. So if the condition is diagnosed, the tumor can be removed and the patient can be treated. Who should be investigated? Uh, the patient can be sometimes asymptomatic. In a symptomatic patient, history of paroxysmal headache, sweating, tachycardia, pallor, nausea, flushing, unexplained variable of blood pressure, Paradoxical blood pressure response to anesthesia, surgery, or drugs known to precipitate symptoms of PPGL, orthostatic hypertension. All these conditions should lead to uh, investigation for secondary hypertension. Uh, Sometimes patient may be asymptomatic as in case of adrenal incidentaloma. Uh, so these are the cases. Or if there is a predisposition of hereditary PPGL, new onset diabetes in a young lean hypertensive patient. So this should lead to investigation for uh, pheochromocytoma. Now, there are various tests which are available for the diagnosis of pheochromocytoma. There, there are VMA, there are catecholamines in 24-hour urine, there are catecholamine in plasma, there is metanephrine in urine, there is metanephrine uh, total, there is metanephrine free, there is fractionated metanephrine, then there are metanephrine in plasma. So with the available of with the availability of so many tests, 
which is the best test for the uh, patient, uh, patient, which is the best screening test, which should be used for the diagnosis of pheochromocytoma. <clears throat> so briefly before going to which test is best, just a brief about what are uh, catecholamine, what are metanephrine. So I'll move to my next slide because we all know noradrenaline, uh, dopamine, they are uh, uh, produced in the adrenal chromophony glands. So norepinephrine and epinephrine, they are uh, free catecholamines. They are converted to normetanephrine and uh, metanephrine. Um, and the, the, this normetanephrine and metanephrine we call as free metanephrine. Uh, during uh, in the excretion of the urine, they are converted into sulfated form. So these conjugated metanephrine are called sulfate conjugated metanephrine. So when a uh, assay major both free metanephrine and conjugated metanephrine, that is called as total metanephrine. Whereas when a uh, assay majors only free component, that's called free metanephrine. So in urine, generally we major total metanephrine, whereas in plasma, we major free metanephrine. Uh, whether total is better or free is better, there is a debate. There is no clear-cut guideline to say that total is better than the free metanephrine. So generally, plasma metanephrine, when we say what we major is free metanephrine, when we say total metanephrine, uh, it's uh, uh, in the urine, we major total metanephrine, which includes both conjugated and non-conjugated form of metanephrine. And what, what's the meaning of fractionated? Fractionated means we give uh, results of both metanephrine and non-metanephrine. Um, so only metanephrine, we use the term total metanephrine, but when we say fractionated metanephrine, that means we give the result of both normetanephrine and metanephrine. Why it's important to do fractionated metanephrine? Because there are uh, by and large normetanephrine, most of the tumor they secrete normetanephrine, this is in high concentration. But uh, we have seen cases when uh, where only metanephrine is increased. So therefore, it's important when you advise uh, for metanephrine, you should ask for fractionated metanephrine so that the lab gives you both normetanephrine and normetanephrine. Okay. Similarly, when we say fractionated catecholamine, results of both norepinephrine and epinephrine are given to you. <coughs> These are the guidelines published by Endocrine Society in 2014 for uh, biochemical diagnosis of pheochromocytoma and paraganglionoma. So the recommendations from these guidelines, they came that the initial biochemical testing for PPGL should be either plasma-free metanephrine or urinary fractionated metanephrine. The, the, so the which test to be used, either plasma-free metanephrine or urinary fractionated metanephrine. Second thing, what the recommendation came that for the diagnosis, the method should be either liquid chromatography with MS spectrometry or uh, HPLC with electrochemical detection. So the method recommended is uh, LC MSMS or HPLC with ECD detection. The other methods such as ELISA's and all, they should not be used. I will come to the uh, point that why ELISA should not be used. And for plasma metanephrine, draw blood with the patient in supine position and use reference interval for the same position. So the very important uh, guideline that the test should be metanephrine either in the plasma or urine. The method should be LC, MS, MS or HPLC and the sample should be collected in a supine position. <coughs> and the positive result should receive appropriate follow-up. So uh, why, why not catecholamine? Why not VMA? Why metanephrine? So the limitations of catecholamines that catecholamines, they are secretion, uh, secreted in a uh, episodic manner and their half-life is very, very small. So unless you collect sample during the episode, you may miss diagnosis. So the false negative result, the sensitivity of catecholamine is very, very low. So that's why because of our pulsatile secretion, episodic nature of secretion, you tend to miss uh, diagnosis. So there is a risk of false negative in patients with adrenal encidinoma and with paroxysmal hypertension. Uh, VMA has a, a high specificity, but it has a very low sensitivity. Uh, yes, VMA is elevated in 90% of the cases of neuroblastoma. 
so uh, still like unfortunately still we see lot of request for vma i would like to emphasize in this platform that if you are suspecting few chromocytoma in an adult the initial screening test should be metanephrine it should be either urinary metanephrine or it should be plasma metanephrine uh, uh, metanephrine why because metanephrine as i showed that they are uh, metabolites of cat uh, norepinephrine and epinephrine and these metabolites since they are uh, they have a very long half life they are not dependent their concentration is not dependent on the episodic nature of catecholamine so they are produced continuously and uh, they are uh, uh, circulate in a higher concentration for a longer duration so and their secretion is independent of highly variable catecholamine release caused by tumor or by sympathoadrenal ex excitation that is why uh, metanephrines are preferred over uh, uh, any other uh, uh, test fractionated metanephrine is the best test because most of the tumor they secrete one metabolite either adrenally or noradrenally so if we measure only one of them because those uh, labs which do this test by elisa you have to individually ask that you want adrenaline or you want noradrenaline you want metanephrine you want non metanephrine because in elisa you cannot measure these two analytes simultaneously whereas if you are doing hplc or you are doing lcms ms both the parameters are measured simultaneously so if you just write fractionated uh, catecholamine or fractionated metanephrine you will get result of both adrenaline and noradrenaline whereas if you are doing by elisa you have to ask uh, these two tests separately because in elisa either adrenaline is measured or not it so you they, they, these two are different tests they are two separate tests Uh, so uh, fractionated metanephrine is um, uh, preferred test that is the best test for uh, as initial screening test so this is a comparison that whether plasma should be used or urine should be used there is no clear cut guidelines because various studies have been done they find plasma is slightly more sensitive than urine 98% 97% and specificity wise plasma is more specific as compared to urine so you may say plasma is more preferred but as such guidelines does not say they say both plasma and urine are acceptable the only advantage which i can think of with plasma is that you don't need to collect 24 because in urine 24 hour urinary sample has to be collected which hampers a patient's daily activity so otherwise if you look at sensitivity the uh, the sensitivity of plasma and urine is comparable <coughs> so patient preparation what is the patient preparation avoid sympathomimetic agent like ephedrine amphetamine and nicotine avoid any interfering medication drugs like labetalol sotalol uh, acetaminophen they interfere with hplc method overnight fasting is preferred no caffeinated or def caffeinated beverages should be taken so uh, so the, this is about patient preparation for blood sampling for metanephrine the patient should be in supine condition at least for 30 minutes which as to, as per endocrine society guideline also that the patient sample should be collected in a supine position after 30 minutes of the rest once the sample is collected it should be placed on ice the plasma should be separated and it can be stored at minus 20 for 3 months for urine sampling the sample should be collected in a uh, container having additives normally we have to maintain acidic ph so in our lab we um, give 24 hour urinary container with uh, 50 ml of hcl in that Uh, the storage uh, urine container should be stored at cold place acidify urine ideally it's not recommended to acidify urine in the lab ideally the uh, sample a uh, 24 hour urinary container in which sample is being collected that should have uh, uh, a urine uh, that should have a acid in that so that the entire sample is collected in acidic atmosphere so these are the guidelines for collecting metanephrine free plasma as i mentioned that it requires you have to collect sample in edta tube uh, we are writing two because the volume required is high 4 ml of plasma is required so collect sample in two tubes centrifuge them and then this can be 
separated. Fasting is mandatory. Specimen should be collected in supine position. Patient should be at rest for 30 minutes. After immediately after collecting the sample, sample should be immersed in ice water. Uh, just a minute, my battery is running low. I'll just connect my uh, charger. Just give me a minute. I will request the audience if they have some questions. Meanwhile, they can put it in the chat box, as Madam already told earlier. So uh, this is the procedure for collecting metanephrine. And then the plasma is stable at 6 hours for room temperature, 72 hours refrigerated and frozen for 3 months. The technique we use is LCMSMS. Similarly, for 24-hour urine, 50 ml of uh, helicot, this is what is required. So collect urine in a 50% HCl, which is already there in the 24-hour urine container we provide. pH should be maintained between 1 to 2. Do not use concentrated HCl. It's 50% HCl which is used. 24-hour uh, urine volume has to be recorded. It should be shipped refrigerated and frozen. The uh, patient should avoid these drugs like alpha methyl dopa, codeine and all. And uh, we do urine uh, by HPLC and uh, electrochemical detection. Uh, so the method have evolved over a period of time. I will just take a few minutes to uh, that which methodology is uh, best. As mentioned by Endocrine Society also, LCMSMS or HPLC, over a period of time, uh, from calorimetric acid to radio amino assay, the, it has evolved to LCMSMS. Amino assay or ELISA are recently introduced in 2010. And uh, the testing has also moved from VMA to catecholamine and from catecholamine to metanephrines. LCMSMS has the advantage that it has very high analytical sensitivity and it has very high analytical specificity. In the same uh, sample, you can measure uh, uh, metanephrine as well as normetanephrine. Similarly, for uh, ECD also, it has a good sensitivity and uh, specificity. Whereas when we look at the amino assay, the amino assay has, uh, though the cost is less, its uh, instrumentation cost is not very high. You don't need expert people because to handle SCMS and LCMS, you have, have to have expertise to handle these instruments, you have to have expert, educated person who can, uh, who knows how to read LCMS result and LCMS. Immuno essay, you don't need very expert manpower, but there are a lot of disadvantages because these essays, they have poor accuracy, they have poor analytical sensitivity. You have to ask for individual essay to do the testing. So normally amino assays and the guidelines also does not recommend amino assay. So it's uh, not recommended to do these tests by amino assay. How do you interpret a uh, initial positive result? So uh, normally, uh, because we know that there are a lot of factors which can give you uh, false positive results. So it's important that when you diagnose a case, you have to have a very high level of suspicion. And when you look at the, if you get a uh, slightly elevated, if the results are normal, then the tumors are highly unlikely. But if the results are elevated, you have to see what is the extent of elevation. If the extent of elevation is three to four times of the upper reference limit, then most likely it's a positive case and you should investigate further to locate imaging studies and uh, consider uh, make a diagnosis of pheochromocytoma and investigate. Whereas if the elevation is less than three to four times of the upper reference limit, it's important that you rule out any cause of false positive and do a repeat analysis. On the repeat analysis, if the result is normal, the tumor is unlikely. Whereas still, if it remains elevated, then you investigate further to rule out uh, uh, pheochromocytoma. Uh, um, I have already discussed these in my previous slide, so I'm not repeating this. <coughs> so false positive we discussed, but there could be some cases of false negative results, especially as I mentioned that um, extra adrenal tumor, sometimes they may not produce any 
uh, cat collar means so you may get uh, false negative results then small tumors if the size of the tumor is very less less than 1 cm you may get false negative results dopamine producing tumor they you may not you may get false negative and microscopic recurrence of the disease so these are the some conditions where you may get false negative results this i have already discussed uh, for true positive false positive at least 3 to 4 fold increase would indicate true positive results and if uh, metanephrines are mildly elevated ideally rule out any false positive case and uh, repeat testing so this is summary again I have to emphasize the indications that uh, metanephrines fractionated metanephrine should be the first line of test and the technique should be lcmsms and the sample should be collected in a supine position that's about uh, Dr. Sudhi, do we have time to go further for primary hyperaldosteronism because it's already 8.44. Would you like to continue? Ma'am, uh, this topic is also very important. If I request if you can just expedite and tell about the basics. Okay, of so we should collect the sample just because the basics, everyone knows. Yes, the I'll, I'll just run through it. How we should collect the sample? What right. are the so primary aldosteronism uh, again uh, uh, you know that it's a very important it is the most common cause of secondary hypertension and if identified it's a curable condition and uh, uh, or the treatment actually you can uh, the specific treatment can be started to avoid any car cardiovascular morbidity uh, so uh, 10 to 30 uh, percent 31 percent of the population are hypertension uh, in our case it's 25 percent and 10 to 30 percent of the cases they have resistant hypertension and in this case 10 to 20 percent of them may have primary aldosteronism this is a study which was done to see prevalence of primary hyperaldosteronism in our country in indian population and this study uh, it showed that the prevalence of um no, this study actually revealed that the prevalence of secondary hypertension is very high in young adults and estimated it to be 30 percent in 18 to 40 years it's an indian study with, in which prevalence of aldosteronism was studied <coughs> um, who should be screened then uh, yeah so, you can show the previous slide yeah. yeah so uh in case of uh, this is a bit busy slide but uh, the for aldosterone and uh, renin because there are multiple factors which affect aldosterone level and renin level so uh it's uh, important that the potassium levels are corrected hypokalemia because hypokalemia tends to lower aldosterone secretion to avoid any false negative result, it's important that the hypokalemia is collected or uh, the hypokalemia. For plasma aldosterone, the low salt solution is a low salt type, high plasma aldosterone. So, generally recommended that 24 hour urinary sodium should be measured. Uh, before taking plasma aldosterone concentration. So, uh, so uh, uh, the patient should not be taking diuretic at least for weeks uh, before taking sample for uh, plasma aldosterone. For uh, uh, renin, this is more for a lab that if renin concentration is less than 0.2 nanogram per ml for PRA or 2 milli IU for direct renin concentration, they should uh, uh, not use it for calculation of uh, aldosterone renin ratio. This is more for a lab. Then the uh, patient position, the patient should be either in supine position or in a sitting position. If in the supine, sitting position, it sh should be in sitting position at least for 60 minutes before taking the sample. And the plasma half-life of plasma renin and aldosterone is around 15 minutes. Therefore, uh, this time uh, this time is required because so that it brings the value in the baseline. The, then the specimen handling is also very, very important because both for plasma renin, aldosterone and uh, 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 so, so renin, you are aware that there are two kind of assays which are available. One is plasma renin activity, which is measured by RIA. Another is direct renin concentration. So these two assays, in my next slide, I will explain what is the difference between the two. 
प्लाज्मा रेनिन एक्टिविटी हिस्टोरिकली और फॉर अ लॉन्ग टाइम प्रोबेबली इन मोस्ट ऑफ आर सीनियर्स दे वुड हैव सीन प्लाज्मा रेनिन एक्टिविटी बीइंग मेजर्ड बाय आर आई ए एंड देयर आर स्टिल मेनी क्लिनिशियंस दे बिलीव we have more faith in plasma renin activity than the direct renin concentration direct renin concentration assays are available for last 5 uh, 6 uh, years only they are very new but uh, the advantage of direct renin concentration is that that the specimen handling is not uh, that stringent as in case of pra because uh, a pra assays it depends on the ph of the assay uh if uh, that's uh, I, i mentioned earlier as also that rias are generally manual they uh, they are uh, based on a manual ability of a, a operator whereas direct renin assays they are independent of ph they are independent of angiotensinogen levels they are uh, available on a fully automated uh, chemiluminescent platform therefore the they are very very precise whereas pra assays are not very precise uh, the there is a poor inter laboratory reproducibility and over and above very important that handling of blood plasma samples and for case of pra uh, the uh, uh, <clears throat> the blood tube must be immediately placed in a ice water uh, so that angiotensin because there what we major is angiotensin conversion of uh, production of angiotensin so uh, if there is more of a baseline angiotensin you may not get correct result so handling of, of blood sample for pra is more stringent because you need to keep sample immediately in ice whereas for direct renin concentration the sample can be handled at room temperature and direct renin therefore now is there is a <coughs> move from there is a shift from pra to direct renin concentration so uh, uh, these are the instructions for handling aldosterone and plasma renin uh, sample what you need you need to collect sample in a yeah. patient should be in upright position this is the instruction which we have given in our guideline for at least for 2 hours prior to the test as soon as the sample is collected the sample should be plasma should be separated and should be frozen certain drugs which need to be avoided are potassium wasting diuretics pyrinolactone amylorite uh at least for 4 weeks adrenergic blocker clonidine methyl dopa i i can share this paper also because there are lot of drugs which can interfere with aldosterone and uh, renin <coughs> um and if it is necessary to maintain hypertension control patient should be treated with other anti hypertensive medications like verapamil hydralazine uh, or terazosin which have a lesser effect on plasma renin and aldosterone level and any change in medication definitely this is for us that it should be in consultation with the treating physician uh plasma renin and aldosterone they should always be frozen after separation uh, and should be stored uh, for four weeks uh, in this uh, condition uh, so i think with this uh, i'll end my uh, presentation and i'll hand it over to dr sudhi and dr uh, seniors Uh, for further to take it further thank you thank you very much ma'am it was such an elaborate and very important to uh, uh, you discuss today and i learned a lot from this i learned a lot there are uh, these questions that as a an endocrine surgeon come into my mind and i hope to each party sir gupta uh, sir and dr nimi kansal can help me find out the answer so can uh, i just want to understand like this pthrp is it really available this test is available and we can ask for it or is it uh, only in the books you are uh, you are mute ma'am pthrp at present we are not doing in our lab we are also sending it to quest lab in usa but definitely if there are request we start getting uh, request for pthrp we can um, like rather i would like to know from endocrinologist do they see value of this test and if they see the value of this test we can consider starting in our lab at present we are not doing it sir can you put some light on it what about pthrp we often heard hear about it but uh, is it really practical and we really for it or not Well, do you really feel the need of this test? Yes, sir. 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 Yes, s
or you feel that by the whatever is available you are able to diagnose hypercalcemia of malignancy yes sir are you able to hear this sir yeah i can hear that and is my voice coming yes sir yes, you are very well audible so PTHRP is uh, obviously required when you have hypercalcemia and the PTH level is not elevated, and then you are trying to search out what is the cause. So definitely, it's not required terribly uh, frequently, but it is required. For example, right now we had a, a youngish girl, and uh, this problem arose, and then. Um, we did a 125 because we wanted to know whether it's um, uh, the PTH was not elevated. So then we had to go step by step. And since PTH RP was not available, we did a 125, and we found out that the PTH RP in uh, Dr. Kansal's lab was going to take a while and very costly. Yeah, yeah uh, because we are outsourcing, so it's very yeah. costly. Yeah. So I think it, it it should be available in uh, India. Uh, mm -hmm. It should be available. How cost effective it will be that uh, the lab has to figure out. Yeah, so I have made a note of this. We we'll just check how what we can do. Because for us, launching a test is not a problem, but then there has to be a requirement. Because if the clinician they need, they feel that it's required, then actually, uh, hypercalcemia or malignancy, hmm. the most common cause is PPHRP only. Yeah, so, so we, okay, definitely. I have made a note, ma'am. Maybe I'll get back. I think once it is available, we you may get you can, yeah. gradually yeah. gradually the things will work out. So yeah. but second very important so now we are clear that people charging the requirement of the physicians of the endocrinologists, but because of lack of availability and uh, non cost issues, it is usually not done. But it is a potential which one must think of. Uh, yeah. Secondly, uh, uh, you are very much right that most of the time we ask for 25 hydroxy vitamin D okay, with the uh, IPTH and calcium and other things. And if uh, vitamin D is less, we most of the time think that it is hyperparathyroidism is due to this low vitamin D, so it is secondary hypoparathyroidism. But uh, uh, with normal calcium in it, uh, this is very borderline kind of case. We are often in such condition and we most of the time lend up correcting this 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So you told, you uh, told about this 125 hydroxy, which is the active form. So is it a routinely prescribed 125 hydroxy vitamin D or what, what what do you say? Should I stop doing 25 hydroxy vitamin D and start asking for 125? Or no, normally, like uh, uh, you, when you want to know nutritional status of an individual, it's 25 hydroxy vitamin D, which is good enough because 25 hydroxy vitamin D gives you information about the uh, nutritional status of the individual. So that's what is most commonly asked. But for 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, there are very specific indications. We we routinely get in our lab because being a reference lab. We get samples from all over India. So routinely, we are doing it as a routine, very common test. But normally, that's not a test which should be asked routinely. There are specific indications, like in case of re uh, renal failure or you are suspecting resistant hyper, uh, hypervitaminosis D and all. So those are the conditions where uh, you would ask for 125 dihydroxy, but not as a routine. Okay. It has to be 25 hydroxy vitamin D. So, so my understanding is, my understanding is so any patient with suspected hyperparathyroidism, rather than asking for 25 hydroxy vitamin D, I should ask for 125, which will give me a true value of the uh, okay. vitamin D status. So yeah. Even if it is uh, high because of uh, PTS, so I know like the correlation will be more uh, more rational if I ask for 125. Very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much for this input. अच्छा उसर माय क्वेश्चन इस सर इस वाटिया सर क्योंकि गुप्ता सर में आंसर सपोज एनी क्वेश्चन विथ हाइपरटेंसिटी यूजुअली सी सच केसेस इन इमरजेंसी इन आईसीयू सो दिस पेशेंट्स आर यूजुअली कैथेटराइज्ड सो इफ वी थिंक ऑफ डूइंग अ 24 आर इन्फेक्शनेटेड मेटानेफ्रिन इन दोस केसेस दोस केस दोस पेशेंट्स आर इन so what do you suggest? Like, first of all, what should be the collection protocol? Should we 
take the sample from the bat or go for plasma mechanism estimation? What do you suggest? Sir? How do you do your sample? To whom is that question, Sudhi? For each party, sir, and take it with us, sir. So actually, I'll tell you what we do in our uh, department. Yeah. Uh, uh, we we collect the urine metanephrines and metanephrines as fractionated uh, as fractionated uh, analytes. And the reason we do urine, though we thought many times that we should. So first of all, we don't have an LCMS MS or a SPLC. So we do it by. Uh, an ELISA, which is not so good as an LCMS or HPLC, I agree that that is better, but it has served us well over the last uh, many years. So that is one thing. And the reason, even if patients have a, a, can collect the plasma or want to collect the plasma and it is easier, and even if we start it here, but I don't do it is because of the of the very specific requirements of that collection. And then especially I feel very difficult about the transport of that sample. So, you know, the, uh, I feel that uh, maybe in, in the lab where Dr. Kansal works, the transport is very good and they monitor the temperature and so on and so forth. But as she herself has mentioned, the the catecholamines, the metanephrines, etc. They are very, uh, especially in the plasma, they are fragile. And if you don't transport them, collect them properly, you don't transport them properly, you don't take all the precautions, then you may get uh, reports which are uh, not reliable. And then depending on that report, you do many other things. You start looking for tumors, you start doing MRIs, you start doing PET scans, etc. So, so, we just thought that it's a little difficult for patients to. So, if, for example, the patient is collecting it at the at the main center, and it's you know the precautions which are taken for collection are uh, are followed to the to the dot, then it's all right to collect the plasma. In fact. Uh, as Dr. Kansel has said, there are not too much difference between urine and plasma. Each has some advantage and disadvantage. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned about plasma, you have to be very specific about the conditions of collection. And urine means <coughs> that you can collect it uh, uh, in a bottle. The patient can probably even do it at home if you give proper instructions. As long as you've given a few ml of acid to the patient to put into the into the into the box in which they are collecting, it is not so difficult to do it. So that is the only reason we do uh, urine. Plasma is probably as good, it's probably simpler. And if we are just afraid that if you open up plasma to everybody in our own institute, for example, everywhere they will be collecting plasma and we will be getting samples which are not properly collected. and. Uh, uh, our lab will get a bad name rather than, you know, uh, serving the purpose of the patient. So, uh, sir, what do you suggest? Like, so patient is catheterized, and uh, uh, and we want to know whether this patient, uh, this patient's secondary hypertension is due to this pheochromocytoma. We want to collect metanephrine. So, should we take the sample from the Eurobag directly? Or is there any other way we, we must wait or something like that? How do you do at your place, sir? Suppose a call comes from neuro ICU uh, regarding a patient with basal ganglia bleed, suspecting pheochromocytoma. So, how do you proceed in such cases? First of all, I don't like to, uh, unless that patient had a hypertension, a severe hypertension, some reason to really suspect, it is better that the patient is not stressed at the time when you're doing this collection. Because, like it was mentioned, uh, any form of hypertension can raise the levels of metanephrine by, by what, in, you know, any, any type of hypertension and stress also will elevate these levels. And unless you have a level three or four times above the normal level, 
you can't be 100% sure that it is due to a tumor so i think that if it is not uh, terrifically terrifically uh, likely that there is going to be a, 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 a tumor there it's better to wait and you know collect the sample when the patient is not terribly stressed or in the icu or uh, uh, and let that let the collection be done after a couple of days i don't think catheter and all should really make a difference you can always whether you collect in a bottle and you put it into a larger bottle or you collect it in the catheter from the catheter and you this thing the important thing like dr kansal also said is that you must have a very complete collection you cannot have a complete you know so what she has already mentioned that how you and the other thing we also always do is to send a creatinine along with the uh with the metanephrin or metanephrin sample so that it will tell you a approximate idea that is the collection of the sample adequate in males we know that so much creatinine will be excreted in females we know so much creatinine will be excreted and you should always send that perfect sir thank you thank you very much you made very valid point so the take home message for all the participants so whenever you get any call from icu that the patient has some hypertension related complication and uh, what we want to evaluate we have a high clinical suspicion but still i think that time better to manage the patient as per the protocols and once the patient is settled her is is her stress level comes down later on we may evaluate the patient for uh, this pheochromocytoma because in icu I, this is not the time when the patient is in severe stress already the levels will be high so we may get the false results and we may be end up lending uh, doing unnecessary imaging investigation so i think this is a very valid point and i just want to say that uh, uh, i think that 25 hydroxy d is the important sample to collect not 125 in patients who have hypercalcemia and that is because the commonest much more common than having it due to 125 being elevated etc it is because patients have been given it ordered at amounts of 25 hydroxy you know cold calciferol and so on and so many injections of uh, uh, vitamin d they have taken so many sachets of vitamin d by doctors and by themselves self medication also and that is in fact one of the common causes of hypercalcemia uh, pth of course will not be high in that case but but i'm saying that 25 hydroxy d is the first step whether you need to do 125 or not that is the second step you can decide later thank you thank you very it's much it's a costly assay also a costly test also it was a wonderful and like i enjoyed the presentation very much and i learned a lot but since we i have lot of questions and other things but i think now we are short of time and uh, i request kk gupta sir each party sir please give your uh, uh, feedback your comment your suggestions regarding the presentation to all our participants who are practicing endocrinology and endocrine surgery and uh, following which like we may have some concluding remarks and we may wind up the session yes, i think dr kansal has very well uh, deliberated very in a very lucid way you now all the steps what what i spoke in a, uh, just in while i was introducing the topic that uh, collection and subsequent steps are very very important uh, so that you get a proper result now she has very well uh, uh, told about the advantages of ria versus any passage which we are undertaking now and then uh, 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 the basic thing about the the tube business which, uh, which many pathologists are not still well versed with that was highlighted so that these are the ground realities which one faces at times and this is not ignoring now Uh, I like to just have a small comment that uh, some ten percent of even sustained hypertension people could have hypochromocytoma. It's not that it's only the episodic hypertension or the those with paroxysms or what you call spells they have this. So that they where one has to have a high index of suspicion even in those people who are having sustained hypertension which is not being controlled. And uh, Of course, the primary cortisol has been very well highlighted in terms of cortisol that uh, uh, the Cushing's diagnosis, and this has stressed the importance of urinary and salivary cortisol, which is going <laughs> at the back foot now. 
So that this is a very simple test and that is useful also. Now I can only say that Dr. Kansal has elaborated all the aspects of the hormone assays and the modern things and the latest, latest what you call recent advancements, which we are thinking only by sending to Lal's lab, but they are sending overseas also. Uh, but uh, these things are possible only at the very high institutions level like SGBGI and of course, uh, you know, part of the institutions which can, which usually order and which can uh, stick to those tests. But at the same time, uh, I congratulate Dr. Kansal for a very elaborate discussion of the topic. And I'm sure that all the audience, the physicians, endocrinologists, pathologists, and three surgeons, that reminds me of a problem. Bible's proverb that a wise man is strong, but the knowledge would add to the strength of the person. And I was really confident that the knowledge imparted in this session would go a long way to tackle those very, very difficult, what you call uh, endocrine problems, which a normal, which a physician is apprehensive to deal with, like uh, hyperandrogenism, like uh, uh, this hyper energetic hypertension, and all those things. I'm thankful to Dr. Kansal. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think uh, credit goes to Dr. Sudhi. She, she was like, I think we have had two, three meetings prior to this session just to discuss what is expected out of it, what it should be, what is like, uh, what kind of way. So I think Dr. Sudhi, they, she had really given me very nice inputs which me to prepare this presentation. She's the driving force. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I really need your kind comments regarding our meeting. This is a small effort from our side. Yeah. Doing it, it's a multi speciality program. So now we have endocrinologists, we have endocrinologists, and we can hear and give our opinions to each other. I think uh, it, uh, the time has come to conclude this session now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really, uh, you would like to say something, madam, or I should conclude. Okay, so uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, dear participants. Thank you very much for taking out your precious time to attend the meeting. And uh, I hope you. Would have, you also have learned along with me? I have learned a lot, uh, especially about DRC. DRC is the concept I am hearing for the first time. I think it is a promising test that I will consider next day. Please, uh, uh, I'll just show we had a running presentation, but to hopefully, some specific patient, we will try to take this topic again so that we will learn more. And, more. and uh, uh, to the information to all the participants, this meeting is recorded and uh, as a protocol, we upload all our meetings on YouTube for future references. So in case due to any reason you were not able to attend the meeting in full and you want to have a relook, then you can visit to our channel and can, re can uh, see the meeting again. And uh, uh, for all those who practice best, so friends, we have a, breast, a very important breast meeting planned for April, in which we will be discussing about the post MRM lymphedema, uh, and uh, it's a very important topic that we, the important problem that we face as a breast surgeon. So be uh, here for that, and uh, we get, after after few. Uh, after some time, I will be circulating the message. That meeting will be a bit early, one week early. That is in the third week, most probably. So please be tuned to our WhatsApp group, uh, where we will be circulating the message. And uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank once again to all our guests, moderator, uh, speaker, and all the participants for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. So Thank I, I now want to the meeting. I am closing the session. And uh, your feedbacks and comments would be very encouraging and motivating for us. If you would like to please share your comments about the meeting uh, in our WhatsApp chat or maybe in YouTube that uh, video when we upload. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Everyone, Thank you. good night. Good night. Thank you.